and a welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the origins controversy. I got multiple questions sent in from viewers over the past couple of months regarding ring species, and the shows have been so packed that I had put off responding till now. Corleen wrote in from South Africa. Good day, Ian. Thank you for the show and the work you are doing. We need more like you. I have a question that comes, came up as I was sharing my belief of a young Earth with my cousin. His response to my point, that animals do not evolve but is able to adapt, was, quote, How extreme can this adaptation actually be before it becomes evolution? End quote. He confirmed that he believes that a horse and a donkey is different, but probably comes from the same kind of animal. However, he claimed, a hyrax and an elephant shares the same DNA or something, or proof exists that they came from the same animal. I unfortunately didn't know about anything of this about this hyrax elephant link. Do you know anything about this? I do not believe in evolution and was wondering, do evolutionists differentiate between adaptation and evolution? And if they do, where does they say where do they say does the one stop and the other begin? How far can they push adaptation? How different can animals be but still share the same origin animal? Essentially, what is the difference between evolution and adaptation from a creationist perspective and the evolutionist perspective? Hope I'm expressing myself correctly. Thank you again. Corleen was, indirectly, asking about what is known as ring species and the speciation question. Now, we creationists, of course, do believe in diversification of species. For example, we would say that all dog kinds came from one dog kind, which was taken on board the Ark of Noah. That's right. The wolf, the Great Dane, French Poodle, and Chihuahua all arose from one dog kind, probably something like a wolf. In fact, we can historically track when these different kinds of dogs arose. Why? Because people bred the specific types of dog. Notice what has happened, though. The world's most useless dog, the Chihuahua, wouldn't survive a day in the wild. So it wasn't natural selection that bred the Chihuahua, but rather unnatural or directed selection. People directed the selection. They specifically separated out certain traits and then bred the remaining dogs in order to weed out attributes that they did not want. Uh, for example, to breed a Chihuahua, they separated the smaller dogs and smaller from each generation to achieve the ultimate useless dog. Notice what these people did. They removed information and variation from the gene pool. You will not be able to breed a German Shepherd from two Chihuahuas. Why? Because the German Shepherd, while it is a dog, has different genetic information that the Chihuahua no longer has, because that genetic information was methodically removed by people in selective breeding. Now, this is not evolution though some of the extremist evolutionary camp are trying to redefine different breeds of dogs as different species. This variation within the dogs is variation within the species. Now you will, however, often see dog variation in textbooks with the implication that if dogs can turn into other dogs with small steps, then surely a cow can turn into a whale in small steps and more time. Now, this is where the alleged relationship between the hyrax and the elephant comes in. They're only considered related depending on who you ask and how they deem them related. Many evolutionists disagree that the hyrax is related to the elephant, but it depends on how you define related. You are related to the whales because both people and whales are mammals. However, proposing that the hyrax evolved into an elephant or a cow evolved into a whale is a radical leap compared to dog evolution. First of all, notice that the breeding of dogs is a reduction in variation, not a gain. It is the opposite of upwards onwards evolution. To turn a cow into a whale, you have to, somewhere along the line, develop a sonar system that cows don't have. That's a gain of complexity. And such an observation has never been made in all of scientific history. I might add. All we have observed is the loss of genetic information, the loss of organs, functions, limbs, etc. Secondly, the dogs are still dogs. They can breed one with another. Now, this brings us, however, to ring species. 
Some dogs may technically be able to breed with one another, uh, but it's very difficult to impossible due to the physical variations, for example. A Great Dane and a Chihuahua would have difficulty mating. And so you could consider the Great Dane and the Chihuahua a type of ring species. The most common ring species cited in textbooks has to do with uh, two types of seagull. The different breeds of gulls make a sort of ring around the Arctic where they are found, hence the term ring species. Now, for whatever reasons, be it inability or disinterest between the types of birds, the European herring gull will not breed with the American her herring gull. Now, because the basic and common definition of species involves interbreeding, one could classify the European and American herring gulls as separate species, though they are the same bird. So, is this evolution? Well, like with our dogs, we've watched as seagulls have evolved into seagulls. We've watched dogs evolve into dogs. Yes, there's incredible variation and sometimes even isolation to the point where two kinds won't breed anymore. And you can still, you can even call that a different species if you like. But this is no help to upwards onwards evolution, which requires the gaining of new information, new organs, new skeletal structures, etc. Upwards onwards evolution, which caused bacteria to turn into university professors. Ring species is not the evolution that is taught to us in school. I go into more definition or more detail in Crevo Rant number 41, Define Evolution. I've had a pile of requests for instant digital downloads of episodes of Genesis Week, Crevo Rants, and the Complete Creation video series. Well, we aim to please. Just please note that I am still adding files. Some are for, P for PC, while others are for your iPod. And you can get most of the videos for cheaper than a coffee at Timmy's. Uh, head on over to ianjubi.tradebit.com. I'm working on getting the files on iTunes as well, but that is not available as of yet. If you'll recall, last week we discussed the mystery question. What was it that killed the dinosaurs in Crevo Rant number 17? I showed multiple lines of evidence why the evidence most clearly pointed to a flood. Well, just to stir the pot some more... A paper was given this past week at the annual meeting of the American Geophysical Union, contending that it was volcanoes that killed the dinosaurs. Well, getting closer. Notice the history of claims and counterclaims, each of which refutes the other. First, it was an asteroid that allegedly killed the dinosaurs. Then another group contended the dinosaurs killed themselves by farting too much. I'm not making this up. <laughs> Then another group of scientists argued it was cold that killed the dinosaurs. Now another group is contending it was volcanoes that killed the dinosaurs. Yeah, when you look at the actual evidence itself, the physical fossil conglomerations, the geomorphology of the dinosaur beds, and provincial, sometimes continental geology, it all screams loudly of a massive flood, global in scale. This evidence is acknowledged indirectly in the research papers, and in the museums displaying the dinosaurs. The evidence is easy to interpret. I mean, if you found fossil clams, which had been buried alive with the dinosaurs, as well as other marine life like fish, as well as land plants and animals, turtles, etc., all in the same layer, well, what would you conclude buried them? The reason the researchers keep coming up with the wrong model is because they are ignoring the obvious evidence and not allowing an interpretation of a worldwide flood. Question. Is that good science to remove the possibility of a worldwide flood without consideration? The, the correct answer is no. Science follows the evidence wherever it leads. And in this case, it leads clearly to the interpretation of a global flood. And thus, those who believe in deep time will never get the correct answer because they rejected the correct answer out of hand and have continued to seek an alternative explanation, which is wrong. 